your organisation, you get that gut feeling, and gut feeling is actually quite telling, there's quite a science behind it. And it's that gut feeling that we should be listening to and we should be learning how to identify that feeling and how to identify indications of deception or malintent in that respect, but we often just don't respond. So I started my career in the early 90s, this particular career, as a surveillance operative and factual investigator. And my responsibilities back at the time were to investigate various incidents of fraud, particularly relating to insurance claims, people with bad backs, people who said that their cars were stolen. And I had the benefit, if you like, of following a lot of people, watching people, learning about how they behave, why they do what they do, interviewing a lot of those people, and paying attention particularly to how they try and cover up their deception or their fraud or their theft, <laughs> theft within those organisations. And it's an interesting scenario. As I say earlier, when they're up to no good, they lie. And when they lie, they indicate, uh, sorry, they leak indications of deception. Kind of makes it pretty easy in many respects when you learn what to look for. And that's what I found out over time. The more cases that I did, the more I saw patterns start to emerge with these individuals, regardless of what the nature of their crime was, there were always indicators that seemed to be common across each of those particular scenarios that I worked in. And I became quite fascinated with how people behave and how they hide their untruths and how they commit their crimes. And it really intrigued me. It intrigued me so much that I embarked on a journey of education for me, that was a big step because I didn't do too well at school. Subsequently, I completed a number of short courses, professional development courses, various certificates in deception and evaluating truth and credibility amongst people, followed through to diploma level, graduate diploma, and more recently completed a master's degree in communication, behaviour and credibility analysis. And the more research that I did, and but the more research I did and the more I correlated my experience to that research, the more patterns that ultimately became available. And I found that amongst a lot of the individuals who had done the wrong thing or were doing the wrong thing, whether I was interviewing them directly or monitoring them from a distance, would all have these predispositions of sorts. They, some of them have come from bad families, alcoholic parents. Bradley Manning, for example, if you all remember the, one of the most famous or infamous uh, whistleblowers, um, had alcoholic uh, parents and was abused and uh, was bullied and a myriad of other um, psychological predispositions that all surfaced at the end of the, the big event, let's say. And research ultimately confirmed that there are a myriad of underlying influences that we need to be aware of that are consistent across almost every single case of espionage or insider threat or fraud uh, behaviour and activity within various organisations. There are personal predispositions such as medical or psychiatric illnesses which often don't surface until after the big event, whatever that might be. Some of them are social skill issues, some of them are um, related to who they network with, the type of people they hang out with, the social media that they engage with and how they're influenced and so on and so forth. Then there are personal stresses, so financial difficulties, health issues, uh, marriage problems and so on and so forth. And that progression and those patterns, and we'll go into a bit more of this later, then come into your workspace. So the professional stresses, you've been overlooked for a promotion or you've been reprimanded for something you did or perhaps didn't do within your organisation. And you start to build up this level of anxiety and, and anger and frustration to the point where you often become disgruntled. And these patterns are quite consistent across all cases that I've worked with and certainly confirmed by the research that I've undertaken. So let's move on to uh, Stephen. This is an interesting case. Stephen was a senior manager within a global logistics firm uh, with whom I had a long-standing relationship, business relationship. They were a client of mine for many years. We had worked on a number of various uh, investigations relating to employees who were stealing, whether it was product uh, or committing fraud within within their environment. And the interesting thing is that Stephen was my go-to guy. He was the guy I trusted who knew their business inside out. He understood every facet of the operation. 
he knew all the personalities and whenever we had any suspicious activity he was pretty good at sniffing it out and so he became my guy and we had a great rapport. And a few weeks before the particular incident that I'm about to talk to, Stephen was saying to me that uh, he's a bit stressed at the moment. We spoke very casually about this because his wife was heavily pregnant and due to give birth not too long away in the next few weeks at the time. His elderly parents had moved in with him only a few months earlier and they were getting quite sick. And because his parents had moved into his home, he built an extension and the cost of the extension significantly blew out. And he said he managed to scrape together some money and funding and what have you to cover the cost of that. But he was about nine or 10 grand short and he was really worried about how he was gonna pay for it. He'd actually applied for a C-level position within the organization, which he'd been knocked back on. And he'd been knocked back because his performance over the previous few months had been pretty poor. He'd been showing uh, a level of tardiness, uh, a lack of commitment, most likely because of all the other um, stresses and predispositions that he'd experienced in his own life as he was uh, dealing with the issues. Now the reason the client, the CEO of this company, called me in this particular instance was because there was an allegation that Stephen had tried to install one of the staff members. That staff member himself had undermined the protocol and process within the organisation that resulted in a penalty and contract for a hundred and something thousand dollars and the client's stock had gone walk about. Uh, it cost the company a lot of money. Now before they knew what was going on, Stephen had already caught on to this guy and had seen what he did and saw that this guy tried to cover up the behaviour. But rather than reporting, which would have resulted in termination, Stephen decided to approach him and said to him, according to the individual, give me 10 grand and we'll brush another the carpet. So you can understand the concern. This particular individual was from the Chinese community. He said he didn't have any money. He couldn't afford to lose his job because he'd lose his visa. Fair call. He scraped together nine grand from his family and said to Stephen, I've only got nine grand. Now, what I didn't know at the time is that one of the senior managers in the organization, before contacting me, decided to set up what he called a sting, which I was most against once I found out what had happened. But bottom line is they recorded the transaction. They filmed Stephen receiving $9,000 in cash. And in hindsight, whilst I didn't agree with the process and the way they did it, it was pretty good that they did what they did because it resulted in us identifying the reality of what occurred. <laughs> Problem here for me was that I liked Stephen. So before I knew about the recording, I didn't believe it. I felt this, isn't, this just isn't right. This isn't that guy. And that's what we call the halo effect, and it's quite common when you're looking at insider threat actors, where individuals or superiors within organisations will look at the individual under suspicion, and they won't believe that it's occurring because the benefit and the positive attributes of that particular person's character outweigh, in your mind, the negatives that you're being presented with that you don't necessarily have any evidence on at that point in time. It's called the halo effect, and I'm afraid even I've been a victim in that sense. So in this instance, uh, I sat Stephen down under the pretext that I'd, undertake, uh, I'd discovered some irregularities with the way this particular individual had set up the deal that, uh, that had resulted in this catastrophic outcome. And I said, it's really weird that nobody's picked up on this. Are you aware of it? I won't bore you with the details of the interview. It went for nearly three hours. It started with him being very, very nervous when I mentioned that employee's name. And of course, all the indicators of fear were evident in that commencement of the interview before I'd even pointed the finger at Stephen. And this is important because it helps us form a profile of individuals when you look at how they respond to specific trigger questions when you're conducting a behavioural interview. In his instance, when I mentioned the employee, the blood rushed from his face. Then it rushed back really, really quickly. His pupils dilated, his mouth dried up. What we don't realise is that as humans, something called the autonomous, autonomous nervous system kicks in when, when we're scared, when we fear. It's the fight or flight um, in our DNA. And so, interesting fact, your mouth dries up because the body, the autonomous nervous system says, I've got to run out of this or I've got to fight. And so it stops the digestive system working in the stomach. And so the chemicals and the saliva stop being produced and stop being sent up to your mouth. And that's why you get a dry mouth when we're nervous. Got one now. <laughs> and in his case, 
I could see that he was unsettled, and I thought to myself, well, he should be unsettled if he's across things, and if he's not across it, what's he worried about? He's got no reason to be fearful. To cut to the chase, a series of questions, I finally convinced him that I knew what was going on, and then I showed him the video. You don't need to know the detail other than to say that he was extraordinarily uncomfortable, he was embarrassed, he finally admitted to it, and I asked the question, for crying out loud, I'd probably use some more colourful wording, why on earth did you do this? Why did you jeopardise your entire career? Which was at the time not too bad. And he said, the pressures at home, the fact that I didn't get the job, and I got really frustrated because I'm always catching these buggers doing the wrong thing in this organisation and they always get away with it. Well, it's my turn. And he said, stuff them. He said, why should I put up with this? Why should I deal with it? They didn't give me the promotion I wanted. That was going to, the extra salary was going to pay for them. The, the extensions, the 10 grand that I needed. He said, I saw an opportunity and I took it. And I said, are you sorry? He said, I'm sorry, I got caught, which is really disappointing. Interestingly, at the end of that particular interview, he shook my hand and he said, thank you for being so decent about it. Thank you for your professionalism. And, uh, and he said, I've got a lot of thinking to do as I marched around the door. The follow on from that uh, it turned out to be a much bigger scenario within that organization. It's probably for another presentation because we're gonna run out of time. Interestingly, the interview with Stephen, Stephen that I had um, and my research and understanding of insider threat actors was confirmed when I looked into the psychology of what motivates an insider threat actor, particularly in the espionage case. There's the mouse. So money, ideology, compromise and the ego. And in the case of Stephen, he was motivated by money, and knowing his character, he was motivated by ego. He didn't want people to think he was in any trouble. He didn't want people to think he couldn't afford to pay his debts. He wanted the nice car, the nice house, and the nice lifestyle. Of course, money was a clear indicator. There may have been an element of compromise. By compromise, we mean extortion, ironically, or situations where you're under pressure, somebody's holding your family to ransom, and so on and so forth. And so it's interesting to see that because in reality, it, again, as we saw with some of those predispositions and stresses on the slide earlier, in every single case, these particular four points come up in this analogy, uh, in this acronym, excuse me. I'd like to add retribution to the end of it. It becomes mice and doesn't really have the same effect. But I think um, retribution, essentially because of disgruntlement, is another factor in that respect. With uh, Stephen, when you look at this and when you look at the other slide that we had earlier with those pre predispositions, all the boxes are ticked, it was pretty obvious what was going on. But you don't know this typically until after the event. So let's have a look at Marty. This is a slightly different case, but I wanted to present something that had some value and that you might be able to take away thinking, you know, you could learn from this in, in particular. I never got to meet Marty. Marty, before I was engaged by this organisation, uh, had been with them for about a decade and ultimately ended up as their chief financial officer. Um, long story short, he believed that he had been instrumental in the success of this particular organisation, which was a training and education college, a private college here in Australia. He believed that he was owed something for helping that organisation build and develop into what ultimately became a multiple, a multi-million dollar organisation and a very successful one at that. He became um, quite frustrated though when there was no acknowledgement of the money that he believed he was owed, the commissions that he said were due to him. And so his behaviour changed at work but nobody particularly focused on it. Then money went missing from the books and the CEO pulled him up on it and said, look, you're the only one that's had access to this, you must know something. Of course, he took offence to being accused at the time. His performance declined. He started shouting and berating, shouting at and berating some of the junior staff. And in the last six months of his employment, there were four independent complaints, confidential complaints made against him with reference to how he was treating the staff. He was reprimanded on those. He was dressed down. He was told that he needs to pull his head in. He got particularly aggressive with senior management and he refused to accept that he'd done something wrong. He became a real problem within the organisation. And I'm quite sure all of you have had these experiences within different environments that you've worked. 
In this particular instance, management said that he's become too difficult, but rather than just sacking, which is a tedious process, they decided that they would outsource the financial element of the business. So they had confidential discussions about moving him on with a redundancy, and that was the plan. Interestingly, that meeting was at the end of a particular business day, and at 9 a.m. the next morning, Marty turned up to work and claimed stress relief. And he went off and said, I'm claiming workers' compensation, I'm too stressed in this job. The interesting thing is he made a comment to one of the middle managers on the way out and said, they're not going to make me redundant, I'm off on workers' comp, tough luck. He knew what was going on before it was released or announced that that was what they were thinking. Turns out that he was having a relationship, an extramarital affair with one of the senior admin staff, one of the executive assistants to the director. We didn't know this until quite a fair way down the track. Concerning circumstance. So, when he was moved on, he decided to seek legal action. He got a lawyer and he claimed damages and he claimed that he was entitled to tens of thousands of dollars, six figures worth um, of entitlements and commissions and what have you. Um, moving forward, his, his court case was thrown out. He, he lost his case once again. First thing the next morning, the police were on the doorstep of the college. See, the college worked on uh, a placement program from the state government, or it might have been the federal government, excuse me, where the government paid for students to be educated, and they paid for each student that attended, several thousand dollars per student. Well, a whistleblower had claimed uh, that they were rotting the system, and they were providing phantom students. It turns out that there was never any evidence of it, but unfortunately, not only did the police turn up and investigate the fraud squad, they took just about all of the student files with them, which crippled the business just in its operational aspects. But beyond that, the Department of Education's fee funding program investigators also turned up. And at the same time, the media turned up. The reputational damage to this organisation absolutely crucified this company. They were unable to function with any integrity. The person who owned it was absolutely distraught and that individual themselves was brought into disrepute. I worked with the investigators. There was not a shred of evidence to suggest that anything was even remotely true in the allegations that were made. But these investigations by the police took over 12 months to be conducted. And in that period of time, and nobody short of a handful of people knew this, there were suitors looking to buy that business. In fact, that had occurred before the allegations surfaced. We were then made aware of it. The suitors decided that it was too hot, it was too dangerous, too risky to buy this organisation. And a $40 million sale fell over. The company went into administration and the owner went bankrupt. And this was the abuse of a whistleblower process, this particular individual who felt self-entitled, who clearly we later found out had psychiatric issues, who had done it twice before in the UK that we didn't know about until later. So there were a lot of lessons here. He was delusional. He had uh, this ideology that, uh, that he was the, the guy that built the company, that he had a sense of entitlement to the, the fortunes of that company. He wanted money. So when you look at mice, he ticked the money box. He ticked the ideology box. Not necessarily the, um, the, the, the compromise box, but he certainly ticked the ego box. But that process shut this company down. And it was a really very sad situation to watch, particularly, we got paid, mind you, but particularly given the circumstances and watching the demise of what was otherwise an extraordinarily successful business. It was a true shame. <clears throat> so in this case, Marty's motivation uh, was thwarted, it thwarted a, a very successful opportunity for a number of people, including himself. He got nothing and he walked away with nothing. So with that in mind, and moving to the end of the presentation, um, I want to talk about that uh, concept in research of those processes that we, we've referred to in this report, looking at the predispositions, the stresses, mice, and so on and so forth. And Eric Shaw, a researcher, did some work with the CIA some years ago, in 2015, I think it was. It was. And he came up with the term critical path, the critical path to insider threat acts. And that critical path focuses on personal predispositions combined with those various stresses. They can be personal or business-related or professional stresses.
concerning behaviour, so the, the behaviour that's exhibited by the individual within the organisation that's not right, you know, shouting at staff and turning up late and not following process within the organisation, these are all indicators. And this is the most interesting one that I think a lot of organisations don't realise or understand, and that is poor response, poor response on the part of the organisation themselves. One of the big things that I say to our clients in our field is don't be an enabler. Don't allow the opportunity to present itself. And the psychology of opportunity says that if you leave $1,000 in $100 notes on the kitchen table in the office, over a period of time, if somebody keeps seeing it and nobody does anything about it and there's no response, someone's going to take $100. And if nothing happens, over a period of time, they're going to take another 100 and another 100 and so on and so forth. So don't be enablers within your organisation. You have to address these issues and you have to learn what to look for. So on that note, top six indicators of malintent. This is uh, based on research that was undertaken in 2011. Once again, um, I'm more than happy to share these slides, by the way. I can see lots of cameras going up. Don't panic. Um, I'm sure that Charmaine will be able to make them available to you upon request. Yes, I'll get a thumbs up. This is good. Top six, six indicators of malintent based on the history of insider threat cases, both within government and private sector, over a number of decades. There are actually 12 that were flagged, but the top six were the most common amongst almost every, or within every group of uh, insider threat incidents. And I can see that a few of you are looking at these, and as you're looking at them, you're shaking your head. Now you're probably, sorry, you're nodding your head. You're probably nodding your head because you're thinking, well, I've experienced that. You know, I've been a bit aggressive every once in a while. I don't really want to engage with people. I just want to go and do my job. I don't care when the boss tells me what to do. And probably a few of us have all experienced one or more of those six items. But just because you've experienced them doesn't mean that you're an insider threat. And it's really important when you're looking at this and when you're thinking about what you can take back to your organisations to help you identify potential problems, it's important to understand that just because somebody exhibits one or more of these points doesn't make them an insider threat to your organisation. But what it does mean is if there's a consistency over a period of time coupled with other factors and you know they're going through a marriage breakdown and you know that they've just had a, a diagnosis of skin cancer or so on and so forth, then you need to be a bit more vigilant. And perhaps in the cyberspace, you need to start thinking about user behaviour and start looking at what information they have access to and how that information is protected within your organisation. But it's a very, very delicate balance. It's a fine line that you need to be across. Thank you.